Good afternoon, everyone. As always, it's a pleasure to welcome you to my State of the University address, and I thank each and every one of you for being here. We're grateful to be joined today by Maryland Secretary of Higher Education Jim Fielder, as well as Baltimore City Councilman Eric Costello and Robert Stokes, University System of Maryland Regents Bobby Neal, Bob Pevenstein, and Bill Wood are here with us. From our UMB Foundation Board, we have Carolyn Frankel and Marco Chacon. And from our Biopark Board, Chair John Prue. University of Maryland Medical System Interim President and CEO, John Ashworth is with us, with us together with Senior Vice President Jerry Wollman. From the University System of Maryland, uh, Denise Wilkerson, Chief of Staff, representing Chancellor Bob Corrett. From the Downtown Partnership is Kirby Fowler. And from the Bu Baltimore Public Markets, Robert Thomas. Edith Gilliard, president of the Franklin Square Community Association, is here today. Thank you all for your leadership and support. It's the honor of my life to lead the University of Maryland Baltimore. It's an honor to be challenged every day, to lead it in a way that brings pride to all of you who have chosen to learn and work here, all of you who carry out our mission to heal, cure, and strengthen, to save lives, enrich communities, advance justice, promote the rule of law. We are guided at UMB by our core values. I don't think there are any up on this screen that are particularly surprising for an institution of higher education. Yes, they're uncompromising. And yes, they're not easy to achieve every hour of every day. But still we try. Right now I want to talk about diversity. Diversity means much more to us than the degree to which people from different races, ethnicities, genders, cultures, and backgrounds are represented at UMB. It means the degree to which all of these community members feel welcome here, feel respected, feel valued and heard. The degree to which they feel we have their backs and that they are, in turn, integral to our success. We conducted a climate survey with students last year, asking whether they feel this sense of inclusion. Many of the results were encouraging. In general, students do feel welcome here. They feel supported. They think diversity is embraced at UMB. Nearly two-thirds of students said it's easy to find people on campus who understand them. The same share said they're able to learn about their own cultural community. The same share said they feel close to people at UMB. But that means that one-third of students maybe don't feel these things. Maybe they feel alone and isolated, and that's not okay. Another interesting finding is that while generally more than half of all students here said they socialize with people of different backgrounds, politics, religion, race, sexual orientation, wealth, there was a consistently and significantly lower percentage who said they engage in serious conversations with one another, that they deeply connect with one another, so we rolled out these results this spring, and now we're doing action planning across all the schools. We're having more intentional conversations about these issues. We're listening to students when they tell us what will make them feel fully part of our community and fully celebrated for who they are. We hope to soon share a plan for making UMB more open and more inclusive. You know, this isn't the first time we've explored these issues. 
In 2015, the President's Fellows, that's the group of students we assemble each year to tackle some issue of importance, those students explored cultural competency at UMB. They said we need to provide more faculty and staff training in handling sensitive situations involving culture at the university, that we need to develop better curricula and experiential learning in working with diverse populations, that we need to centralize our resources in cultural competence, that we need to make people better aware of our grievance process. Over the last few years, we've been addressing all of these things. I want to call out one issue specifically. In their paper, the fellows said that despite UMB's attempts to hire diverse faculty, students are nonetheless too often faced with a population of faculty and mentors who don't represent their background and culture. We know this has been a challenge, and we're doing something about it. I talked last year about the transformational funding pool we established, the discretionary fund for investing in initiatives that advance our values and mission. Through this fund, we've created an incentive program supporting schools in their efforts to recruit diverse faculty. One component is financial support to the schools. If a school needs money to recruit a faculty member of color, we'll supplement his or her salary for a period of time. We're also going to lay in resources so that all new faculty, once they're here, have the networks and mentoring they need to thrive. We have also this year been confronting issues that test our values of accountability and civility. We've opened up frank conversations about sexual harassment and misconduct. Any organization as big as this one that thinks it is immune from the reckoning of the Me Too movement is simply wrong. I've been holding town halls in each school over the past few months together with Title IX coordinator Mikkel Kushner to hear questions and concerns from students, faculty, and staff. Some students have shared their experiences with me, and I thank them for their tremendous courage. I've convened a task force on sexual harassment, chaired by School of Pharmacy Dean Natalie Eddington, which will assess how well we respond to issues of sexual harassment and misconduct, how we can do better in that response, how we can educate better, and how we should monitor and report our progress going forward. All schools are represented among the students, faculty, and staff on the task force. And I look forward to their recommendations this summer. As our city and our medical system go through a challenging time right now, I want you to know that we will look to our core value of accountability. And that value, that value will guide our deliberations and our actions. In public and in private, we will hold each other to the highest standards. Because being an ethical organization is different from being a compliant one. But let me assure you, compliance is also in play. Our accrediting agent, the Middle States Commission, on higher education, we did so well with them several years ago, has a standard on ethics and integrity. The standard covers many things, academic freedom, conflicts of interest, grievance policies, recruiting, admissions, employment practices. These are our requirements of affiliation, and they're serious. Over the years, I've headed up several review teams for our peer institutions within the Commission. I've asked pointed questions at other institutions about matters of ethics and integrity. And believe me, we're not above the same scrutiny. You know, the Me Too movement uses the phrase, believe women. It's a powerful message and one we absolutely need right now. I have another. Believe students. 
Believe students when they tell us how they feel. Believe students when they tell us what's important. Believe students when they tell us what to do. The biggest initiatives we've undertaken the last several years are the ones students told us we needed. You know why we have a community engagement center in West Baltimore? Because the students told us we should. You know why we have the grid to support our entrepreneurial community? Because students told us we should. You know why we began developing a cohesive campus-wide strategic plan for our global activities? Because students told us we should. Frankly, our students don't complain a lot. They're too busy. And still, I always ask them to leave this place better than they found it. And somehow they do. Every year our students do. So we're listening to them. We're caring for them. UMB has some of the best experts in the country on supporting professional and graduate students. We have expertise in cultivating wellness, academic and life balance, and mental health. We have expertise in student burnout, stress, and exhaustion. We're doing a scholarly dive into what predicts success for professional and graduate students and what a university's role is in creating an environment that promotes that success. We can carve out a space here for needed research that's desperately needed and we can apply it to a population of students who frankly don't ask us for much. But we, meanwhile, we can make good on what they have asked for. Students want a multicultural center to find those connections that they're telling us are so important. Connections with students who share their background and experiences, yes, but just as importantly, connections with students who are nothing like themselves. This is how you get to those serious conversations I mentioned earlier, the ones students said were missing. The center should provide space and programming where students can find support, and it should help the schools replicate these support networks. It should provide intercultural and interprofessional leadership development so that when students graduate, they will feel equipped as culturally competent professionals. And it should be a resource to all of us committed to strengthening our culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's important we get this right, so we'll be visiting other institutions in the coming months to understand how they organize and program their multicultural centers, how they get buy-in and how they get feedback. I'll be updating you soon on our decision-making in this regard. Two years ago, we began planning for a significant expansion of our Student Counseling Center, our primary source of mental health services for students. Right now, the center is housed in the Health Sciences and Human Services Library. But increased pressure on counseling services has made the library space untenable. So the Counseling Center will move to the Campus Center where we'll build out sufficient space for students who need help. Across the United States, a record number of college students are seeking treatment for depression and anxiety. In a national survey, 40% of college students said they'd felt so depressed in the prior year that it was difficult for them to function. More than 60% said they'd felt overwhelming anxiety. At UMB, anywhere from 400 to 700 of our students use our counseling center every semester. That's about 6 to 11 percent of our student population. Expanding and relocating the center allows us to serve these students better with privacy and comfort and to move toward an integrated solution for student wellness and well-being. I'm thrilled that we're beginning construction next month and we expect services to be fully operational in the Campus Center by January of next year. There's another issue impinging on wellness and well-being that frankly we rarely talk about, and that's food insecurity among our students. 
in a survey last fall, 26% of UMB students said that in the past month, they didn't have enough food for themselves or their households, that they'd sacrificed food in order to make ends meet. We're now brainstorming solutions, a permanent or pop-up food pantry, an on-campus grocery store, or better transportation to the stores off campus, a fund to support students who are food insecure, a strategic relationship with Lexington or Holland's Market, better advertising of the Hungry Harvest Food Market run by our Community Engagement Center. It's early days and we don't have a portfolio of solutions yet, but I mention this because when we talk about student well-being, we need to have a complete picture of the challenges they face. And I know the starving student trope has been around forever, but I don't want a quarter of our students in need of a food pantry. And I certainly don't want them struggling financially after they graduate, burdened with loans they can't afford. So I told you about a, our tuition affordability study last year. We worked with a contractor to define affordability, not for anyone else, just for UMB and working with information from a limited number of students, we developed baseline data models and dashboards. Now we're in phase two. We're going to expand the scope of the Greek programs included in the study. In phase one, we wanted to focus on high debt, but leading to high income professional degrees. But now we're uh, going to expand to the master's and bachelor's program in nursing and social work, together with research PhDs. We'll take into account situations that delay or defer debt repayment, like medical residencies. We're going to triple the number of graduates we look at, and we're going to get a better understanding of their actual income, going through credit bureaus and data analytics firms, so that we know with near certainty how much graduates are actually making, where they're living, and where they're practicing. This better, cleaner data fed into our model will help us predict affordability probably better than anyone else in professional education doing it right now. And this is the first step in making sure that when our students leave here, they can go to work in practice areas and in the geographic areas that need them the most. If UMB is going to drive health law and human services equity in Maryland, then this is mission critical. So I'm going to keep with the theme, believe students, for a little bit more. The year before students tackled cultural competency at UMB, they took on community engagement. They asked a tough and, for many, a painful question. How do we forge a meaningful relationship with neighbors when, for a century, if we are to be honest, systems had been erected to disinvest from communities of color, to disenfranchise their citizens, to preserve segregation, prevent social mobility. How do we as an institution restore trust and work with neighbors on mutual goals and projects? One of the fellow's first recommendations was to establish an urban extension center, which would ultimately become our community engagement center in Poppleton. Let's just say there was skepticism among our neighbors. I'll let Ms. Dottie Page, who is here, a resident of Poppleton and a leader in the community, describe those early days. They opened up the Community Engagement Center, and at first, the people in these communities, we didn't accept UMB too well because we figured they was coming up and buying up all of our property and, and a lot of the neighbors felt like University of Maryland wasn't doing anything for them. They got to see Ashley, Ashley's daughters. She plays along with the children and so they got a little comfortable, you know, they, eat, they eased up a little bit. As I said, Ms. Dottie is here with us today, 
And uh, I just want to thank her for her leadership, her insight and guidance, and her honesty. Uh, I think we all know that the initial skepticism she described is fair. But now I want to show you what the Community Engagement Center looks like today, not even four years later. If you live in the community, you can just walk right here. You can eat for free. You can take exercise classes for free. You can learn so much about your body and your health. So it's, it's you know, we need this. Some people have transportation to go to other places. But you can come here, and on some days, they have medical staff here. You can get your blood pressure done. You can get your eyes checked. You can get your diabetes checked. You know, they have all kind of health services here. So some people don't have money to get all that done. So if you come here, it's free. I love coming back to the community to make a difference because I grew up in this community, raised my three kids in this community. Even though I've grown and I've moved on, I love coming back. When we come together, I try to encourage folks to step out of their shell and talk about the goals that they're trying to set for themselves individually. Their testimony is just so awesome. They're coming back with testimony of lower blood pressure. There are glucose numbers coming down. Some folks have come off of medicine. Folks have lost weight, you know, and people just feel happy. And I just love making folks happy. I'm an everyday walking advocate for the Community Engagement Center. Anybody I, I run into in my travels who may be having a hard time, I share my story with them and I try to stress how big of an improvement my life has turned since I got the job here. It's just a really good overall program for different aspects of your life needs. It's a lot going on in that small area. In that video, you saw some footage of our PAL program, Police Athletic Activities League, which we launched last year with our UMB police. Together, the children and the officers take field trips, they make art, they play computer games, they even put on shows at a local puppet theater. Last week, it was a show called Cinderella in Our City. Almost all of the children participating in the PAL program said they're now more likely to talk to an adult about a problem they can't solve themselves. Almost all said they feel more connected to the community. Almost all said they feel better about the future. Two-thirds said they had more respect for law enforcement officers. This is in a city where tensions have notoriously run high. A city whose own police force is under a consent decree, as you know, with the Department of Justice. And this is why the PAL program and so many programs at the CEC are vital not just to West Baltimore, but to our community of students at UMB. There's nothing for our students like being among our neighbors. In the neighbor's environment, to learn about the realities they face every day, to learn about the history of our city, about the social determinants of health, cultural competence, about working with diverse and vulnerable populations. That's the community's gift back to us. At the end of the last video, Ms. Harris said of the CEC, there's a lot going on in a small area. Well, we're working on the small part. Last year, I said, we were hopeful we'd get the new CEC building at 16 South Poppleton Street. This year, we're grateful, not only that we got the building, we're grateful for the several million dollars we've raised toward its renovation. Four million dollars of that support came from the state, and that extraordinary gift was primarily through the work of the late House Speaker, Mike Bush, 
who believe deeply in our work and our vision. Maryland and Baltimore had an incredible advocate in Speaker Bush, and I am deeply saddened by his passing. Contractors bidding on the CEC project must tell us how they'll hire local workers, how they'll engage with workforce development agencies. I had a meeting a couple of months ago with Ravens legend Ray Lewis, who I'm proud to announce now sits on our UMB Foundation Board. And he told me that the community won't own the CEC unless they help bring it up. And I believe that. We're thrilled that the United Way of Central Maryland will be partnering with us in the CEC, bringing with them their acclaimed Ben Center model, which provides early childhood education, support for teen parents, mental and behavioral health services, homelessness prevention, and workforce development. And we're already looking to something more. The CEC is the anchor of what we're calling our community campus in southwest Baltimore on the western end of our biopark. This is where we'll meet and serve residents where they are, where UMB, our partners and neighbors, can come together within easy reach of one another and access what everyone else has to offer. We already have valuable partnerships and assets on the community campus, and we know that's just the start, that it's going to grow. I'll let Ashley Vallis, our Director of Community Engagement, tell you about it. The cornerstone of the UMB Community Campus is our new 20,000 square foot Community Engagement Center to be renovated just behind me on Poppleton Street. This was a historic property um, that is very meaningful to the neighbors and so the fact that we were able to secure this property and we'll be able to grow our programming about threefold to serve more families and children is extremely exciting to us. Important to the success of the community campus is the number of partners that we've been able to leverage and bring in to this neighborhood. So you can see the community engagement center behind me. Across the street is the James McHenry Rec. That's attached to James McHenry Elementary School, which in 2017 was named a turnaround school by the city. So once you become a turnaround school, that brings in a whole host of additional partners. Harlem Lacrosse, Port Discovery, our School of Social Work runs the community school there. And so as we talk about the REC expanding, our partnership with the school, a 20,000 square foot new facility here on the corner of Poppleton and Holland, one block from the market, a few blocks from downtown, the Lyon Brothers building here was recently renovated with our Graduate Innovation District inside. You begin to see how all of these partners are going to be leveraged and knitted together to offer a holistic program and services for the neighborhood. Now, Ashley could only scratch the surface there in terms of what's going on in Southwest Baltimore. Communities Blooming, the Southwest Partnership Neighborhood Coalition that we support has galvanized an army of partners and investors who really do see this community as a community of choice. And the momentum is growing. Last fall, the City Housing Authority got a $1.3 million grant to plan the revitalization of the Poppleton Hollands area and the overhaul of Poe Homes, which is our neighborhood's public housing complex. If the city is successful in getting the implementation grant, it's an infusion of $30 million into this neighborhood, not just in housing, but in infrastructure, safety, and workforce and economic development. And what's more, the city is investing in four neighborhoods that they've identified as having the best potential right now to achieve inclusive, economically sustainable growth. The reason for this potential is that the neighborhoods have a coalition of anchor institutions, investors, and community organizations already committed to their success, already working together to make change. So guess where two of the four neighborhoods are? One is the Southwest Baltimore community, where everything I've been talking about so far is happening, where more money will accelerate our momentum. And the second neighborhood, well, the second one is Penn North and Upton Druid Heights. 
That's the community labeled West on the map. And Upton Druid Heights is home to the School of Social Works, Promise Heights. So that's two communities in which we're working that have been singled out among several dozen for the city's investment, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Last year during this address, I told one small part of the Promise Heights story, but it's a fantastic part. How with its partners, Promise Heights saves babies. How it shrunk the infant mortality rate in Upton Druid Heights. How it's reduced the neighborhood's low birth weight and preterm rates. How it's basically eradicated infant sleep-related deaths there. What I knew last May but wasn't allowed to announce in this forum is that Promise Heights would soon win a five-year, $30 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education to expand its work in Upton Druid Heights. Not just saving babies, Promise Heights reaches children from cradle to career with parenting classes, early childhood education, community schools, health services, financial literacy programs. And maybe all of that sounds dry until you hear just one story. A neighbor named Jackie wanted to become a hairstylist, but finishing school was difficult. She was pregnant with her second child, and she was looking for safe housing for her growing family. Through Promise Heights, she enrolled in a mom's club, and with a resource mom assigned to her, Jackie gained confidence in her own parenting school skills. She learned about her child's development. She was given needed diapers, supplies, even a crib to keep her baby safe. She got her daughter enrolled in Head Start, and then Jackie finished cosmetology school and landed the job she wanted, which makes her even more confident in her ability to support her family. Now that's a virtuous circle. With more than 20 public, private, and community partners, Promise Heights has put together a network which is laser focused on making sure that children and families have what they need to thrive. If $30 million from the feds isn't an unqualified endorsement of the incredible work that Promise Heights is doing, then I don't know what is. Congratulations, Rick Barth, Bronwyn Maiden, and everyone working to strengthen the community. It's this kind of work we're trying to institutionalize at UMB. A couple of weeks ago, we applied for a community engagement classification from the Carnegie Foundation. It's a rigorous process assessing our institutional commitment to engagement and the extent to which we put planning and resources into it. Now, I'll be honest, the judging is tough, and we don't know whether we'll get it. But it was essential that we put ourselves through the process, essential that we take a hard look at what we're doing to see if it's enough, to see if this work is embraced university-wide, and to find the gaps where we're falling short. As part of the classification process, we've committed to measuring our progress on 20 engagement indicators, things like local buying and hiring percentages, percentage of staff employed at a living wage, dollars spent on public health interventions, and affordable housing. Now that's accountability in action, and it will drive our work going forward. One thing the Kearney process has already set in motion has to do with faculty appointment, promotion, and tenure, APT. At the institutional level, community engagement currently doesn't factor into our APT process. And that means that faculty don't get real meaningful credit for it. I want that to change. I want to make sure that engagement is recognized and rewarded. Because if this isn't part of our appeal to faculty, if we don't explicitly value their work in this area, then I don't think we can claim that it's truly valuable to us. Doing community engagement well
Doing community engagement well isn't easy. It requires, as I alluded to before, that we acknowledge our city's past and some hard truths about how we got to where we are. I've mentioned the President's Fellows a couple of times, how their recommendations have turned into some of our highest profile priorities. This year's group focused on gun violence and how UMB, through its education, research, its care, its service, its advocacy, could address the carnage in our streets, could help us provide trauma-informed care to victims and their families. In the course of the fellows' work, from September of last year to April of this year, just seven months, 168 people were shot to death on the streets of our city. And while I know this problem is bigger than we are, I also know that every institution historically associated with policies of oppression has to reckon with what those policies have wrought. So I congratulate the Cary School of Law on its new center called ROAR, R-O-A-R, which stands for Rebuild, Overcome and Rise, where victims of crime and their families can access the fullest possible range of wraparound legal, social, medical, and mental health services all in one place. Roar will collaborate with every UMB school to mine the vast expertise that resides here. I know the center will quickly prove vital to those touched by crime and struggling within a system that often makes it difficult to move past the trauma of victimization. I've said many times before that the best way to strengthen community is to be one, to talk with one another, work with one another, eat and drink together, have fun together, and if it works, live close together. Because it's hard to be passive about people you actually know and places you actually live. In the CEC video, when Ms. Dottie talks about neighbors overcoming their skepticism and embracing UMB, it wasn't just because of our programs and services. It was because people like Ashley Ballas live with their families in the neighborhood because the kids play together. Since we launched Live Near Your Work last year, giving employees $18,500 toward a home in southwest Baltimore, 23 employees have bought a house in the community, and three more home buyers are in the pipeline. Our partner, Live Baltimore, is hosting a trolley tour this Saturday. This tour will find its way through southwest Baltimore neighborhoods that are eligible for the incentive. So if any of you happen to be thinking about a home in this community, visit our Live Near Your Work website and register. And if you're thinking about a home somewhere else, why not just take a look at what's offered here? You might be surprised. One perk of living in this community will soon be the new Lexington Market. This is a project we've discussed before, but this time we're closer than ever. Developers anticipate breaking ground early next year, building a new market where the parking lot is now removing the atrium at the head of Lexington Street and turning that into an open-air arcade for festivals and farmers market, maybe even, and I've seen these plans, a skating rink in the winter. This is a public square, so important in urban communities, a place where we can gather with our neighbors and enjoy each other's company. Ultimately, the existing market will be turned into an event space for the community, and we hope that parts of Lexington Street can one day be opened up as a pedestrian pathway. As you likely know, the city has been trying to put together a Lexington Market deal for years. We're so excited now that this is moving forward, and I thank Donald Manikin of Seawall Development, who's here with us today, together with Robert Thomas, who runs the public markets, and Kirby Fowler, who led this project during his time as the market's board chair. This will be such a huge asset for UMB and for the entire West Side community. Thank you, gentlemen. 
Of course, our campus creeps right up to Lexington Market. And we know that our campus planning has a huge impact on our community, that our use of land can draw our neighbors in or shut them out. Our use of land can make students feel connected or cut off. It can make our people feel safe or imperiled. We've just begun implementing a geographic information system and 3D computer model to improve how we plan and manage campus change. The new system builds on layers of data, building streets, sidewalks, parks, plazas, landscaping, so that we can see the impact of the development and the interplay of all these components. As we go forward with master planning, we'll be able to show our stakeholders what these changes mean and how they'll affect the character of the campus. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, a rock-solid symbol of progress. We opened HSRF3 last fall. As Louis Pasteur would say, one of our sacred dwellings. Quote, Demand that laboratories be multiplied, he said, that they be adorned. These are the temples of the future. There it is that humanity grows greater, stronger, better. End of quote. This building is a temple to those who will be cured, helped, treated by the science we create there, to those who will be unburdened of pain and disease, Inside this sacred dwelling, our interdisciplinary teams in genomics, the microbiome, vaccine development, oncology, and they're putting UMB at the forefront of new medicine. But in all of our schools, there are incredible projects that are changing how we approach our biggest challenges of human health and well-being, of science, of law, of social justice. They're changing how we serve the communities and people who need our expertise the most. Two years ago in this forum, I mentioned a huge opportunity to bolster our research enterprise, to join with Johns Hopkins University in competing for an NIH Clinical and Translational Science Award. These awards focus on translating laboratory science into the drugs, devices, and treatments that extend and enrich people's lives. This is what we mean when we say bench to bedside research. This is the translation that gets good science out of the lab. These awards are tough to get. It took us two years of planning, working with Hopkins on an application, and I can say to you now that we've won it. This collaboration is vitally important to the people of Maryland because now we can leverage the state's two biggest medical systems associated with the universities. Together, the University of Maryland Medical System and Johns Hopkins Medicine serve three quarters of the state's citizens. This award means we can aggregate patient data from both hospital systems to ask research questions in a powerful way. Questions about the people we serve and how we care for them. We can link our master's programs so that our students gain, gain broader and deeper expertise. We can combine aspects of our clinical research infrastructure to develop not only higher quality programs, but programs with a larger reach across the state. You know, it's time that Baltimore's two most powerful research institutions, frankly, it's two most powerful anchor institutions, forge an alliance around science it's time we did this for our city and our state. And now that we're in this rarefied group, this most prominent group of clinical research in our universities, we can get grants that CTSA-funded institutions are more likely to get. We can secure resources and partnerships and access to expertise reserved for the very best among us. We can build out ICTER, our institute for clinical and translational research, and grow our prominence as a world-class clinical research institution. To Dr. Stephen Davis and Dean Rick Barth for your leadership, congratulations. You know, uh, this recognition will likely have 
a healthy bottom line effect on our extramural funding. And speaking of extramural funding, last year during this very State of the University address, I predicted we'd hit $600 million in grants and contracts for this fiscal year. I was wrong. We hit $667 million. And And since that prediction worked out so well for me last year, <laughs> this year, maybe I'll say we'll do at least as well. Our FY18 numbers is an incredible 20% jump over the year before, a 40% jump over five years ago. Now, it's here I usually segue from idea to impact, how we're taking a risk on our research and putting discovery to work. So I'll mention that last year, UMB had not only its best extramural funding year on record, but also its most successful commercialization year. We disclosed 145 faculty inventions for patenting, licensed 43 technologies, launched eight startups from our intellectual property. We had three of our startups acquired by multinational healthcare corporations for hundreds of millions of dollars. And in turn, we're investing millions of dollars into the commercialization of our technologies, into the growth of our startups, and into locating promising startups right here in Baltimore. So far, we've provided funding or other commercialization support to 13 Baltimore-based companies, helping to create or retain more than 200 city jobs so far. We do this not only because we believe in the power of our own ideas to make people healthier and happier and stronger, but because we believe in the power of innovation to move our city and state forward. I want to mention, though, a company that isn't one of our own, but has been a big part of UMB's work nonetheless. Paragon Bioservices was founded by Dr. Marco Chacon, who sits on our UMB Foundation Board. Ten years ago, Paragon moved into our biopark with fewer than 30 employees. Under the leadership of Paragon CEO Pete Buzzy, the company has grown to 250 employees in the biopark alone. Thanks in large part to Marco Chacon and Paragon, we now have more than 1,000 good paying jobs in the biopark. A few weeks ago, Paragon opened a 200,000 square foot biologics building in Anne Arundel County. And then maybe a couple of days after that, it was announced that the company is being acquired by the drug manufacturer Catalent for $1.2 billion. Catalent is expanding Paragon by 150 employees. That's a total then of 600 in-state employees by the end of the calendar year. Paragon and UMB have driven each other's success over the past decade. And I'm thrilled that Dr. Chacon, such a champion for us and our students, will become the very first chair of our graduate school's Board of Visitors. He'll help shape the entrepreneurial programs and supports we offer students, so many of whom already consider him a role model and a mentor. Congratulations, Marco. Now, I want to switch to the General Assembly session that ended last month. You might already be acquainted with one item approved by the legislature that's for all of us. That's a 3% cost of living increase for all state employees effective July 1st. I wrote that in as an applause line, so thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy your work is being rewarded, at least in this way. And I thank the governor and legislature for making a raise a budget priority. The COLA contributed to an overall 7.5% net increase in our state funding. Some of that money is going toward key workforce development initiatives. The Physician Assistant Regional Network we're developing with partners statewide to ensure that we have a sufficient number of primary care providers across Maryland, especially in shortage areas where access to care is threatened. 
Secondly, the Substance Use Disorder Internship Program, which will allow the School of Social Work to place students in sites where demand for addiction professionals is acute and where staffing is insufficient. That's ERs, clinics, shelters, treatment centers, recovery houses. And finally, we have three new programs at Shady Grove that will help dental providers and other team-based professionals collaborate more effectively in providing comprehensive oral health care. I count as another big win the fact that the General Assembly passed a bill affording protections under state law to Maryland universities using cannabis to conduct research. School of Pharmacy Dean Natalie Eddington wrote powerfully in support of the bill, saying that we need to know the science and therapeutic effect of this plant. And as states across the country legalize marijuana, we need a workforce that understands its potential risks and benefits. We're training the next generation of providers, the next generations of prescribers. And in this mission, we can't be constrained from doing research and education that will protect the safety of patients and advance the peer-reviewed scholarship, where currently there is almost none. While federal laws continue to prohibit our use of cannabis in research, the passage of this state bill puts us on strong footing should the feds reverse course. Science has to lead the way in this. We have to lead the way in this. One of the biggest endorsements of our work came from the passage of Senate Bill 897, which provides additional funding for our strategic partnership with the University of Maryland College Park. Beginning in FY21, we're slated to receive another $2 million every year until 2025, when we'll max out at an additional $10 million a year for this alliance, putting total funding at nearly $30 million a year. There's no way lawmakers would invest this sum of money in a partnership that didn't produce significant returns. They think we're a bargain, and we are. Seven years since we began this Empower collaboration, we've created together two dozen centers and programs that have advanced our research and education and raised Maryland's profile as a center of innovation that serves science and society. The partnership has fueled the state's knowledge economy and brought together faculty and students in ways we never even imagined when we started down this path. The new money will allow us to do two things. First, we'll be able to sustain programs that have already been seeded with Empower Support, critical programs in areas like brain research, substance use disorders, human trafficking. But we'll also be able to launch new programs that gain us visibility, increase the volume of research coming into Maryland, and drive economic development through company formation, job creation, and private investment. We already have our sights on three areas. One is artificial intelligence in medical practice. Between us, UMB and College Park have world-class expertise in medicine, computer science, and engineering. This expertise begs for investment in AI research and its applications, things that will revolutionize patient care and allow us to train the next generation of students who will need to be skilled in this technology. We can also carve out a vital niche in cybersecurity education. Right now, the defining characteristic of almost all U.S. cyber training programs is that they're focused on the technical aspects of cybersecurity. But we can build a more contemporary education model that fuses the technical aspects with the emerging body of legal and policy knowledge that's critical to effective cybersecurity defense. And thirdly and finally, with the creation of a new health system in Prince George's County, UM Capital Region Health, we have a special opportunity to develop an integrated program of research, education, and outreach on issues that are vital to that county's patient population, including healthcare access, cost, and equity. What is crystal clear to me 
is that all of this work I've been talking about, the student success, the record-breaking numbers, the groundbreaking scholarship, the funding that serves as our imprimatur, it shows that we are a potent force for the public good. I briefly mentioned global learning at the start of my address. We've joined the ACE Internationalization Lab to ensure that global learning opportunities are woven into the fabric of our curriculum, that we can expand internationally focused research and scholarship, and that we can engage with our communities here in Baltimore and Maryland using a global, local lens. All seven schools are deeply engaged in this work. And this work is imperative at a university like UMB, because you know at some point, we're going to have to declare our own success. We have to embrace that we are a global university, globally engaged, globally effective, globally powerful. Last year, more than 700 students, faculty, and staff made 1,537 visits to 62 countries, working on critical projects of health, well-being, and justice. We have the world-leading center for vaccine development and global health, changing the very landscape of vaccinology for four long decades. We also have, as well in the School of Medicine, the Institute of Human Virology, a global leader in fighting HIV AIDS, the deadliest pandemic in modern medical history, and we are a leader among U.S. universities in the global local movement, tying the work we do abroad with the work we do back home, linking curricula, strategies, and goals with those of our global collaborators, and freely importing and exporting the best ideas in serving vulnerable populations. Because we know that impoverished communities at home aren't so very different from those overseas. And it's really nothing more than hubris if we believe we can't learn better ways of engaging with and serving those who need us the most here. At the end of this month, we're hosting a global summit organized by the Center for Global Education Initiatives here. It's our first one. I think it's long overdue. The summit grew out of a trip to Kenya taken by a delegation of UMB leaders in March. They met with colleagues from six African nations who support the work of our Institute of Human Virology country directors and staff from Botswana, Nigeria, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Kenya. You know, between the CVD and IHV alone, we have 1,200 program staff and community health workers at our international sites. Almost all of these colleagues are nationals of the host country. They work with us to train, treat, and serve people in their own communities but they don't always feel that they're a part of UMB, which they are. So we need to enlarge the family and bring them into our goals and our planning. We need to provide them access to our people, our resources, our technology, to professional growth opportunities, and we'll be doing all that. At this summit, we'll also do a deep dive into our strategic planning, figure out how we can better collaborate with each other, how we can leverage and get economies of scale, how we can learn from each other and share systems, processes, protocols, so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time we embark on a global project. For too long, we've been engaging in random acts of internationalization. It's time to bring the whole family together and really make change in the global space, just the way we've been doing it in our local community. So I hope that as many of you as possible will join us at the summit. I just said at some point we have to declare our own success. I guess sometimes we let other people do that for us. So here you are. In the School of Dentistry, they're seventh in NIH funding among public dental schools. Our School of Social Work, number 17 nationally in U.S. News and World Report. The School of Medicine is eighth among publics in grants and research expenditures. Carey School of Law, three programs in the U.S. top ten. School of Pharmacy, ninth in the country. School of Nursing, 
five programs in the nation's top ten. No one needs to convince us of our greatness, and I know we're getting comfortable with our stature, because in the last four years, the number of employees investing in UMB, giving back to this university, has grown by two-thirds. These employees support their schools, their departments, their programs, because they know better than anyone else how many people would suffer without them. They know how hard their colleagues work on tight budgets. They know that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And that every student, whether in the community or our own student, should have the chance to pursue her dreams. Many employees have shared their giving stories through the Proud to Work Here, Proud to Give Here campaign. And our own people aren't the only ones who know how great we are. In three years, we've raised $250 million toward our Catalyst campaign goal. The number of alumni and friends who participated in our Giving Day last fall more than tripled. The School of Pharmacy more than doubled its Giving Day fundraising over the year before, raising $70,000 from 332 supporters in just 24 hours, $50 a minute, by the way. The, schools use, the school used challenges matches a campaign that brought an entire community together around the work that unites them. So what unites us? The, the Cary School of Law launched the Ro Roger Wolf Memorial Endowment to honor the legacy of Professor Wolf, who founded the school's mediation clinic, one of the country's very best. The endowment was an enormous effort of family and colleagues who wanted to honor Professor Wolf's memory. All told, 37 donors committed over $100,000. Nearly all the gifts were matched dollar for dollar by our UMB Foundation. You know, in life, Professor Wolf brought people together, and in loss, he's done the same. In supporting Kerry Law Center for Dispute Resolution, this endowment promotes exactly what Professor Wolf believed, that conflict resolution has the power to build a more just society. Dr. Robert Ord chairs the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in our School of Dentistry. He and his wife, Sue, gave $18,000 to establish a fund for the dental care of patients with head and neck cancer who are undergoing radiation or chemotherapy treatment, but have no insurance to cover the cost of their care. The couple established this fund because in his work, Dr. Ord sees far too many desperate people coming to him for help, people who've been diagnosed with debilitating diseases and yet can't afford the very treatments that may save their lives. It's just the beginning for the Ords. They plan to give more to this fund and to encourage colleagues to do the same. Here's a story from the other side of the provider-patient relationship. Ms. Yvonne Wright was a patient in the School of Medicine's Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Nutrition grateful for the compassionate care she received from her physician, Dr. Ava Port. With a $5,000 gift, she launched the Patch Fund to support low-income underinsured patients with diabetes who can't afford their medications and the everyday items they need to allow us to live a life of dignity. She says patients shouldn't have to choose between buying food and buying insulin. The fund gained support from the division's faculty and staff and from their colleagues across departments and even schools. Not all of them promote the fund. They identify patients who need help, they encourage others to give. It's a movement now. And sometimes people trust us with their gifts simply because they know we'll be good stewards of them. Pat Bernstein enlisted the School of Nursing in a project called Hidden Voices in which city residents reveal their secrets via postcard. It's meant to highlight what we share with our neighbors and what we don't. How can we find in these very different voices the barriers that impede social reform? Hidden voices will find life as a public art project, but first it needs someone to code the stories coming in, 1,500 of them so far, and analyze the data. Ms. Bernstein's gift to the nursing school funds a researcher who will help us better understand and better communicate the needs of the city's people. 
needs that obviously are so great for so many. Some projects, too, galvanize a community around them. Nonprofits, corporations, foundations, individual donors, the social worker in the library program run by SWACOS, the Social Work Community Outreach Service, has won support from all of those kinds of sources. And why not? The program brings clinical social workers into the Enoch Pratt Free Library to meet neighbors where they are, to open access to services they might not seek out on their own, to provide support in a safe, familiar space, basically to make getting help as easy as going to the library. Last fall, Good Morning America named Enoch Pratt one of the nicest places in America, in part, they said, because of this program. And our donors agree. And sometimes our benefactors become a whole world to someone else. Every weekend, our UMB Cure Scholars attend Saturday Academy in our Lexington building. And every Saturday, Officer Evelyn Greenhill works overtime, so they can. Every Saturday, she greets the scholars, gives them a smile and some encouragement. Two of the scholars have grown so close to her that they asked her to be their mentor. One of the scholars, Michael, stops by the Lexington building on non-cure days just so he can get a hug. So when Officer Greenhill noticed that one of the scholars didn't have warm enough clothes in the wintertime, she bought hoodies, long johns, hats, and gloves. When one of the scholars said she wanted to do a spring break tour of historically black colleges and universities along the East Coast, but her family didn't have the money to send her, Officer Greenhill became her sponsor. A portion of her paycheck every two weeks goes to the CURE program because that's what it takes to support the city's young people. Officer Greenhill was just named our UMB CURE Mentor of the Year last Saturday. And I think she deserves a round of applause. Philanthropy is something we have in our own hands. And if we think that policies and investments at the local or national level strip vulnerable people of their rights, if we think they sometimes punish the least among us, that sometimes they fail to support the science that will save us, that they sometimes fail to uphold the rule of law, that they sometimes don't reflect our values, and our priorities, we can, through philanthropy, make the nation and the state the community we want. I said at the very beginning of this speech that it's the honor of my life to lead this university, to know upon waking each morning and falling asleep each night that our work matters and that our people do it as if Lives depend on our excellence and our innovation and our passion, because lives do. In July, I begin my 10th year as leader of UMB. It's nearly inconceivable to me that I've been given this privilege for a decade. I'm so deeply grateful to this community that we've built together, a community founded on knowledge and discovery and truth, a community founded on inclusion, respect, understanding, a community founded on empathy and compassion, a community founded on the certainty that together we can take what we're building here and make this place better, make us better. Look, there is really no end by definition to our mission 
because we seek to improve the human condition. By its very nature, it's a work in progress, as are we. And for your extraordinary partnership on this journey, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.